Uh, and then uh, I'm just going to say, like, your students, you're all students, I think. Raise your hand if you're a student. Yes. OK, good. Um, so what, what can you do with AI right now if you're in accounting, if you're in HR, if you're in marketing? What do you, where does AI sort of fit into your career over the next, uh, maybe if you're graduating at the end of April here, as you go into industry, or if you're you know, sort of second year, first year, second year, third year, like what do you sort of do with AI and what can you do with AI right now? So I'll sort of talk a little bit about how this can uh, sort of uh, be something you might want to start to investigate. So um, I, I know I've talked to a few of you during the, the dinners I got down here yesterday afternoon and, and sort of have been trying to mingle and say hello. I think they call me a cultivator. I'm totally happy to chat with students. In fact, it's the best part of my job is talking to students, the teaching, the assignments, like I hate them just like you. Actually, I don't, but um, I, I really, you know, sort of appreciate the idea of uh, us just chatting and just talking about, you know, sort of ideas. And I think that's what education and, and uh, uh, school is about. So uh, I grew up in Alberta. I was actually born in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Don't really have much memories of it. You know, I, I'm sort of uh, still kind of uh, have lots of family out there and have been back uh, quite frequently. Not so much in the last couple of years. Our kids are just sort of older and they don't want to travel and grandparents are you know, getting older themselves and, and that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, so I've been in Alberta. Um, I am jealous of people who, like you, get to travel a lot and do exchanges. I, I just never did that. And I don't know if it's just a product of the time or the opportunities weren't there, or maybe there weren't even planes when I was uh, a student. And, you know, I just had no way to get anywhere very quickly. And so for whatever reason, I, I never felt a, a reason to leave Alberta. Um, I am an alumni at the University of Alberta. You can see I'm in anthropology and English, not business, not computer science, not uh, uh, technology. There just wasn't those programs in the late 80s, early 90s. Like computers at that point, there was no internet. It was really just sort of a time where uh, you, you kind of did a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, that kind of stuff. And I never wanted to be any of those. So I wanted to be Indiana Jones. And so I went into anthropology, majored in archaeology. Of course, not a lot of archaeology jobs out there, and so you want to raise a family. It's like, what are you going to do back to school for another 10 years? Uh, and so I did go to Nate and, and did a computer engineering degree. So I learned how to code. I even learned how to build circuits, and I even did two calculus classes, which I don't know how I passed them. I, I think the professor was just kind. <laughs> just saying, like, you're putting in an effort, you know, knowing full well that I'd probably never used calculus in my life, and frankly, I haven't, and uh, have been just fine. Uh, I'm married. I have two kids. Uh, I've got a, a dog, which I just really love and spoil, but uh, very high maintenance. Uh, I, I play video games. I grew up a, a gamer, I guess. I, although today I'm more of a collector of games than an actual player of games. Uh, I read. I was lying. I don't do any. I'm lying here. I don't do any exercise. Um, but uh, I do walk my dog, and uh, I don't know, like some weights. I, I'm I just go hang in a monkey bar. I don't know. Is that exercise? Maybe it is. Uh, currently, I'm an associate executive professor. That's my official title. I, that's a whole union thing. They give labels, but I'm just a teacher, I think. Um, as I said, the business technology management major, which is really that sort of inter intersection between technology and business. Uh, I, uh, here's a list of, you know, sort of some highlights of my career, starting as a paper person. Boy, gender specific there, boy. Uh, paper boy for the Edmonton Journal. Um, worked fast food for, I think, two weeks and then promptly quit. And I'm like, I will never work in a restaurant in my life. I, it was like, literally, I, I didn't realize that if anyone's been a fry cook in an organization that, you know, like McDonald's or something, you got to clean out all the, the fat trays and all that kind of stuff. Well, I did that, but didn't realize I had to sort of close the valve. And so uh, I dumped the hot oil back in, came out the bottom. And that night I just said, I, I quit. This is not for me. Uh, cashier, sales associate, I worked at a music store for a number of years, managed the store, worked commission sales, worked for a web developer. I think I might even talk to uh, some students here. Uh, that company went under, didn't get paid for a month. That was kind of an interesting sort of aspect of it. After I graduated, uh, I went and started as a systems analyst at Epcor in the late 90s. That was right around, if you remember, Y2K. The world was going to end because of Y2K. Well, it never did. But boy, did we panic about it. And checks had like two digit years on it. It's like, oh my God, it was crazy. But uh, made it through that. Uh, literally just got tired of working downtown and started my own business. And still to that day have a business, obviously not doing it too much. Um, started teaching at Nate in, uh, actually I should say 2008. Uh, started as a sessional here at 2013, the University of Alberta, and uh, was sort of doing my consulting company. Uh, and then uh, ended up getting a full-time position here, which is where I am now in 2016. Um, so I've tried many things. If you had said to me, you know, 30 years ago in 1980, like you're going to be teaching business students at the University of Alberta, I would have said, no, there's no chance in, in doing talking at a conference like this. 
So you never know where your career goes. A lot of my career was uh, just people I know, networks and sort of getting opportunities at uh, places and, and jobs that I was really interested in. So that's kind of my background. So who am I? Uh, grew up a hacker uh, before computers. Like my hacking was on a telephone, like a rotary dial or a, oh my God, touchstone phones. I don't even know if you guys have landlines in your house. Like does TELUS even sell them anymore? I don't know. Uh, a technologist, obviously, my parents, for whatever reason, um, in 1978, bought us, me, my brother, and my sister, a uh, Apple II computer for Christmas. I learned how to program on it. Both my sister and my brother were just not interested in it, so I kind of got to dominate the, the computer. Uh, so I learned programming by typing in code from magazines that you could sort of buy in, in stores. A data analyst, a problem solver, an entrepreneur, a solution architect, and a user of AI. I'm starting to use a lot of AI. And I, I will say, as a gamer, like I did a lot of, you know, sort of playing with AI in video games. You know, I count that as a user of AI. So if you play video games these days, any game on your phone, you're probably a user of AI. Um, I mean, if you watch Netflix, you're a user of AI. All the recommendations are sort of AI generated. Um, and so when I started to think about what I wanted to talk about today, I, I really looked at my life and I'm like, boy, am I a digital hoarder? And I was like, you know, maybe that has a bad connotation, but I love just browsing the internet. I am a big fan of the RSS feeds, news feeds from sites and sort of collecting them in an app. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And I you know, sort of save it and share it to my uh, pocket uh, from Mozilla. It'll sort of keep the text and all that kind of stuff. I don't pay for sort of the service on that kind of stuff. But you know, I'm like, tomorrow I'm going to read it. And I never do. Like, I think I've got something like 18,000 articles since I've been using it. And I decided that I was going to start to look through my hoard of digital stories and just pull them out about AI and just sort of give a bit of a survey, like what sort of happened in the last year and maybe a couple of months, two months, maybe, a, you know, like end of November, maybe a year and three months. So much has changed in that AI space. It's not new. It's been around for, for many decades. Uh, like I said, I was playing, you know, video games back in the, you know, late 70s, early 80s, and there was a rudimentary AI in it, you know, lots of AI and, and sort of industries and those kinds of things. But I think what happened was my dad started to know about AI, right? Just people started to get access to it and, and they could start to use it. Students who maybe didn't think about it could say like, oh, we can start writing reports and doing our assignments and those kinds of things. Like that would, I think was the big change. As they say, you know, if it makes mainstream media, if like global news is doing articles and stories on artificial intelligence, because schools are going, we want to ban it. We don't want students to use it. That's a sort of different type of technology than, you know, someone at the University of Alberta or any of the other universities in the computer science department, you know, doing the Texas Hold'em poker things, building algorithms, like deep mind at Google. You know, that's sort of like the scientific research side of things. And I think there's two distinctions to be made there. So I wanted to go through my digital horde of, of uh, news stories and just sort of pull some interesting stories out over the last year and just kind of have a quick conversation about it. What are the themes? What are sort of the concerns? You know, when it was first released, what is happening today? I think maybe some of you are sort of looking at AI today. And if you see Google, I, I just said, released um, their Gemini for, oh, my phone is going, it heard me say Google, so. Um, they released their, their Gemini Pro. It's free right now. Obviously, they're going to take it away and sort of put it behind a paywall. They want to sort of monetize it. To me, that's a big question. Do we want you know, for-profit organizations in control of our AI in the future? Like, is that good for society to have a profit-driven motive on a lot of the AI development, which is exactly what's happening in our world today? It's the Microsofts, it's the Amazons, it's the OpenAI, and we'll talk a little bit about that here. So really wanted to just give you a bit of a survey of what's going on. Uh, I do want to make a disclaimer up front. I am not an artificial intelligence expert. I am not a researcher. I'm not a neurologist. <laughs> like, I don't know how the brain works. I can talk about synapses and whatever else goes in there. You know, I, I think the brain is pretty important and it's pretty complex. And maybe we're trying to mimic the uh, uh, the brain in, in computer systems. Like, I don't know anything about that. Frankly, I'm not interested about it. Yeah, other than maybe just saying I'm not a neurologist. I'm not good at math. I just told you, like, I can't believe I passed my two calculus courses. Like. Put a uh, quadratic equation in front of me. I don't even know what that is. I don't even know if I could solve it. You know, like so. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a data scientist. I've played with data. I've used data, but I do have lots of questions, right? And I think I will possibly have fewer answers to some of those questions. I think that's just the nature of of where you know sort of artificial intelligence is. How I'm going to talk about it today. Uh, I do want you to start thinking about problems in different ways. You know, this is going to sound like a class. There's no test, although I have a a, a couple of uh, 
uh, polls. So maybe if you want to start pulling out your phone, I'm going to get you to join a, a, a poll in this to sort of see where people are at here. Uh, and I know I will run out of time. Thank God we have nap time after this, so I can continue to go into you know the next hour and a half if you want to hang around and, and uh, chat with me. Um, I would say you know for myself, just be aware of experts and misinformation. I mean, I think the biggest challenge in the world today is what's real, what's not, right? You know, how do you trust? How do you believe things? That goes back to a lot of data. But now AI is generating a lot of the content out there. So, you know, who are the experts? I'm not even sure we can define experts. I mean, I'm gonna talk about two different sides to AI, but if you go into, you know, a consulting company like Accenture or Deloitte, and I'm not here to pick on anyone, like they're just at the same level as everyone right now. We're sort of trying to figure out what's going on and, and how we maybe can utilize some of these tools to, to do something productive, something valuable. Uh, and so, you know, like I think, if you're interested in, in sort of artificial intelligence, you could be what we call an expert. Like you go into an organization and you're the one that knows how to use that, you become an expert, right? People will start to come to you. If your parents are asking you like, how do you use this? I think you become a bit of an expert. Now, do you have like 15 different titles behind your name? That's not the kind of expert I'm, I'm sort of saying, but yeah, sort of be prepared to think, to be prepared to sort of question, to do the research. I think that's part of the innovation is just sort of figuring out how we can make use of some of this kind of stuff. All right. So I'm going to use Mentimeter. So if you want to join uh, the website here, I, I, I hope it will work. I'm going to maybe do a couple of tests here. So I'm going to flip over to Mentimeter. And the joining code's at the top there. So menti.com, the number's 9737233. And so I'm going to ask the question. I've got two sort of questions I want to ask up front here. One, in the past seven days, have you used an AI in a professional setting? All right, I'll say that school or work. Have you actually sort of made use of this in your job or maybe in school? Um, doesn't matter what you use it for, if it's using it as maybe a replacement for Google. Just want to sort of see if people are, are aware of, you know, sort of the tools out there and are willing to experiment. I'm, I'm going to kind of guess that it's probably on the pretty high side because of your generation. And I'll give you a couple of minutes here. I'm kind of going to go, I think, 10 after, I think is when I started. So I'll try to finish at 10 after. Uh, so that's what I'm going to look at my, my clock here. So 23 people, 88% uh, have used it in some sort of professional setting. Um, and like I said, that could be school or work. Maybe you used it to help, I don't know, spell check uh, an assignment you're putting in. Uh, I'm not going to make a judgment on whether you're allowed to use it, but I think that's sort of the point of my next question. Good question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would say Grammarly is AI for sure. Yeah, the spell check in Word would be something like that, Google Docs. Yeah, I would say that's, that's all sort of AI. Um, and I'm not gonna, you know, like we'll talk about sort of how you feel and whether there's a sense of right and wrong. I mean, I think that's a big challenge with AI right now is like, should I be doing this? Is this the right appropriate situation? Am I going to get in trouble for doing these sorts of things? Uh, but you know, we're almost up to 90% here, which is what I think I expected from you. Like if I went and pulled my parents and their friends, I, I think we'd probably be the opposite. Like maybe even zero would have used this, whereas they might not even know about it. Um, and so I think that just sort of says like, okay, so you're aware of it, that's great. Uh, I'm gonna flip over to the next question here. So generally, how is AI perceived in the professional setting in which you used it, right? I'm gonna give you three choices here. I know they're maybe not all the best, but supported, maybe, yeah, it's kind of interesting, but you know, we sort of maybe have to have, take a bit of caution with it or negatively meaning like, we're gonna try to ban it and you're not gonna be allowed to use it. Do you sort of get a sense of that feeling when you're using the AI? And that might be partly just who you are, your beliefs, you know, your sense of right and wrong, your ethics, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not sure where this one would have went. Um, I think if we're sort of talking school, I think there maybe is an expectation that, uh, uh, or maybe just a desire to use it. So maybe that's the cautiously. Uh, few, what do we have, almost 30 people here. I think that's probably close to the room here. 7% uh, supported. For myself and my classes that I teach, I'm fully supportive of it. I, I'm still trying to figure out you know, what it means and, and how to kind of make the best use of it. All right, so I'm gonna leave that there. We'll come back for another one in a, a second here. All right, so let's look at some news articles. This one here, and I've got a, a poll, November 30th, 2022, so two, I guess, years ago, but uh, really I think only 14 or 15 months. Um, OpenAI published on their blog. I remember coming across my news feed. I'd sort of been aware of OpenAI, knew they were sort of working on some things. Um, always, like I, as I said, I've always sort of tried to follow techs, uh, tech companies, kind of see what they're doing. Uh, I will provide the slides after I put a link at, at the bottom of all of the uh, slides where that comes in. Um, you know, and, and this is just, I just pulled some text and just tried to highlight some things. Um, ChatGPT interacts in a conversational way. So if you use it, you sort of 
you know, I'm sort of getting used to the sense that when I say you, or you're, you're kind of talking to the artificial intelligence. So that's the idea of a conversational way. I think we probably have all used, you know, Google Assistant or Siri. You know, it's kind of the idea is to be sort of uh, talking, having a natural conversation. Maybe it feels more natural in some cases than in others. One thing I haven't experimented myself with is the idea of can you talk to ChatGPT and can it sort of talk to you like the Google Assistant or Siri? And I'd, I, I don't think I've seen at least something in, in my career. Are you saying you agree or yeah, you? They, can, they can't do it. Yeah. So. Turn on voice and just talk to it. In the browser? In, at least in the app. In the app. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the, uh, the browser, I don't think you can do it is because you can't guarantee that there's a microphone on the computer, right? Like, there may not be one on there. Um, you know, learning about its strengths and weaknesses, right? So, I, actually, that third bullet point, we're excited to introduce ChatGPT to get users' feedback, right? Kind of like what's working and what's not working. So, I think that was kind of in 2022, at the end of November, um, you know, like, we're not sure <laughs> it's going to go. Like, we'll put it out there. We'll see what happens. Maybe people will use it. Maybe they don't. I mean, I guess in business, there's no guarantees that it will work. but this chat GPT was literally the quickest adopted website. Uh, you know, Facebook was one, you know, threads sort of came around as another one, like, oh, we had X number of users by this time. Like we adopted this, like we were starving for <laughs> like water, we were hungry. Um, and so I think that's where you start to see this explosion. I remember at, when this was sort of released, um, it was the end of the semester. I'd kind of heard rumors about it, and I started to think, okay, well, what does that mean for the next semester? <laughs> right? um, you know, you started to see articles on the news. So I'm just going to put another question out there. Do you remember being aware of ChatGPT at that point in time? I'm not asking for the date of when you do, and it's okay if you didn't sort of keep be aware of this, but you know, was it sort of up front there? Was it sort of later as it started to meet the mainstream? Your friends maybe started to talk about it. Maybe you started to, to look for things. You know, and I think this I'm sort of expecting to be a, a little bit more as I'm seeing here, sort of 50-50. I mean, unless you're kind of a nerd like me and, and reading it or interested in it, you're probably not going to, to sort of see these kinds of things. Probably not going to go to the blog and start to reading it. But I think it started to become into the public consciousness. As I said, when you know Global and CBC and the Global Mail are sort of talking about these kinds of things, it starts to become more into the public consciousness. And thank you for answering the question. This is fun. There will be a test at the end of this. Year. So in uh, December, um, a prominent AI ethicist, uh, ethics uh, researcher says Google fired her. So this was a, a story about Timnet Gebru. Uh, she objected because the process was unscholarly. So she, her job, and she's still around, she doesn't work at Google anymore, obviously, um, discussed the ethical issues raised by recent advances in uh, AI uh, at Google, right? And so her job at Google is really to kind of keep AI in check from an ethics perspective. Are we okay to be doing this? Is this something we should do? Knowing that we've never been in a place in our world where we've had to deal with this kind of issue. We've always had ethics. I mean, go read Plato and Socrates. I mean, it's all about ethics and those kinds of things, but not around artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence, the data that we're feeding into it, the biases that go into it. So she wrote a paper. Google did not like that paper. And so Google said, uh, you're fired. <laughs> and they said, no, we fired her because she didn't write a good paper. And we're going to. And so there was a lot of controversy in December of 2022, where it's like, who do you believe? <laughs> who do you trust? Like, he said, she said, I'm fired, you were fired. No, we fired you because, you know, you didn't do a, a good paper. It wasn't very scientifically, it was unscholarly. Uh, I've listened to podcasts with Temnit later. She's great to listen to. She's very young. She's a, a, a female. She's definitely, um, like, very smart and this kind of really recommend you know if you get a chance to, to sort of read anything or listen to her, an interview within her podcast like she's very um aware of the ethical side of uh open ai of chat gpt of google's uh, artificial intelligence of just you know the gender of the ai uh you know as a, as a whole um and so she helped assemble a small team of computer social scientists dedicated to ethics inside of uh, google's ai research and i like the idea of the social scientists because i think that's going to continue to be more and more important in our world is the human behavioral side of things, right? Everyone in this room is an individual, is a human, right? You have your own beliefs, your own, uh, you know, needs, your wants, all of that stuff that makes you a human. Um, what does that mean for the AI, right? You, we may not view the use of AI in the same way. So if you're in a group of, of, of 10 people in an organization and you have 10 different opinions, that's going to be really difficult to sort of figure out what's the right answer to use maybe this for a particular problem you're trying to solve. Right, and so the social sciences side of things, and that's where I sort of come from, anthropology background, 
um, you know, it's really about just sort of humans and, and how we sort of form, you know, groups and societies. Um, oh, this is in 2022 as well. Uh, why those AI generated portraits all over social media? So this is from CBC Radio. Uh, it's an interview. I remember coming across this and going, there was a big deal. Like everyone was generating images of themselves, just telling, you know, things like uh, stable diffusion, like create an image of me and or uh, draw a picture of this. Well, there started to be concerns like, is our copyright? <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing with this? Are we stealing people's work? Uh, this is a story about uh, Greg Rutowski. He's an illustrator. He does things like Dungeons & Dragons, Magic the Gathering. You sort of probably, if you play video games, you probably see that sort of art style. Well, now <laughs> he can, uh, an AI could churn out similar art. And so he started to raise the concern that, um, now what about my livelihood? Like, that's how I make my money. Now, if an AI can generate the art for you, you don't have to hire me. Uh, Sarah Silverman, the comedian, has sued uh, because her book was ingested by ChatGPT. And if you ask it for a summary of it, the Cliff's notes of it, so she's like, well, that's not you know sort of fair use of it. Um, I'm going to quote a, a, or have another article from Lawrence Lessig. He's a copyright sort of uh, lawyer down in the U.S. Um, he's kind of saying, no, it's it is free and like it is in the public domain if you release it and you can use it. So there's like these varying questions. And so I might ask the question, when encountering AI generated creative content, how is it important is it to know that it was created by an AI? Like, do you want to know? Do you care? Right? An image, a, a picture, is that something that you think about? And it might be a different, I'm not sure where this is gonna go, somewhat very important. If you're an artist, you might care more about than someone who's not. Right? And these are the kinds of questions, particularly around business, like how do we use these kinds of things in marketing? Right? How do you sort of say like, we need a picture of a family that's you know buying a new home and you just go to Stable Diffusion and go like, hey, generate this picture for me, is that okay? Like, where is that information coming from? Uh, you know, I'm gonna talk about Sora from OpenAI uh, in a bit here. That's changing like video now, right? So you see some, it's not perfect, but this is like day one. <laughs> you know, what's gonna look like five years from now, 10 years from now? All right, 45, somewhat important. Yeah, I, does that say, someone who said sort of somewhat important, I'm just picking on that because it's the, the 45. What is your thoughts behind that? Yeah. Context dependent. Context dependent? You're trying to sell something or spread some sort of, I don't wanna say propaganda, it might be, uh, it's yeah. useful to know that it's AI generated. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. You know that it's, well, just look at deep fakes, for example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, what is the context behind it? Yeah. Well, it's not intentionally deceiving. It could be like a family purchasing a house, just like a picture of it. Like, not the website, but it's like a video of like some presidential candidate doing something that actually never did. And now, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And again, I think it goes back to context, goes back to, um, you know, I, I get think a sentence of right and wrong, like just using these tools in, in ways, although, you know, right and wrong is in the eye of the beholder. Like some people may not think that's wrong. So interesting sort of questions around the creative uh, AIs that are out there, the generative AIs. Uh, I'm going to try to keep going here. Uh, here's when I started to really start to see it in the news. This is from the Global Mail back in January 6th. Here's the one that I have to go behind the paywall for you. Uh, why does ChatGP and why are schools blocking it? Right, like <laughs> elementary schools, universities started to to uh, you know be aware of this and go like, well, that's that's it. We're just going to block it. And as someone who's been in, in technology for my whole life, like that's really hard to do. <laughs> you know, I'm sure some of you, maybe all of you, at some point during high school or junior high school, figured out a VPN could get you around the content restrictions in a elementary school Wi-Fi network. Like you guys know how to get around this kind of stuff. That's I mean, that's insulting your your intelligence if you think that's gonna block me. I mean, that's how you sort of crowdsource things and you sort of figure that kind of stuff out. So are we gonna block this? Right? You just go home, like your parents are gonna block it for you. Uh, you know, you just bring your phone and all those kinds of things. So, um, you know, a lot of the, the challenges was, you know, the idea of the written word, papers, English papers, you sort of hear the impact. And I know a lot of uh, uh, English professors on our campuses are saying like, don't use it, right? At the same time, why not? Could be a good idea generator. So those questions, free to anyone with internet connection designed to be more user friendly. So going back to sort of early chat GPT. And if you look at the timeline, like this is two months later, barely, right? This is like the beginning of January, semester just started. We're back to school after the, the, the break. And we're already starting to think about this and, and chat GPT had just released it. So what I said earlier, like it was just really adopted very quickly. Uh, February, Seinfeld's taking over Twitch. I'm a huge Seinfeld fan. I grew up on Seinfeld, yes. Thursday nights, so I was NBC Thursday night watching Friends and Seinfeld. I think I actually have Friends songs, socks on right now. Right, this is a Twitch channel. 
AI-generated content. It was sort of based on AI uh, or uh, Seinfeld episodes. Uh, it was, I mean, it's still out there. It's a little tough to watch. It's not like Seinfeld. But the idea is here's some AI-generated content that's out there. And, you know, 15,000 viewers, like, I don't get 15,000 views on any social media, so I'm not on it. But you know, there may be people out there who'd be happy to get you know 15,000 people. But it was in the media; people were talking about it. It was sort of a new thing, um, and that was February. Using this, they ran into, as you would imagine, some of the content that came out of it from the AI was maybe not appropriate, <laughs> and so they had to like take it offline for a bit and sort of figure out. I just saw Google uh, was doing some image things. I just saw today an article that uh, they had to turn off uh, Google's image generation because it was sort of putting out things that weren't very appropriate. Uh, you know, can they fix it? Do we know what's going on? I think that's sort of where some of the innovation is coming from. Uh, this goes back to uh, Tim Gabaru from uh, earlier December there. Uh, Microsoft lays off the team that taught employees how to make AI tools responsibly. This is from The Verge, Casey Newton and Zoe Schiffler. Great newsletter if you're interested in Subsec, just sort of keeping up on a lot of sort of tech and, and uh, social. Um, these Microsoft have a dedicated team to ensure its AI principles are closely uh, tied to product design. I don't know if anyone sees themselves in, in sort of product design, but here's a, a, two, or a team that was sort of, are we doing the right things? Like, are we doing what we should be doing? Um, still maintains an active office of responsible AI. Microsoft, remember what I said earlier? Do you want like the $3 trillion Microsoft company, which if you look at their history, you know, haven't had maybe our interest, uh, you know, an individual's best interest in mind, controlling AI, here they're getting rid of their, their uh, ethics team, critical role ensuring the company's uh, responsible AI. Pressure from uh, Kevin Scott and the, uh, the CEO of Satya Nadella is very, very high. CEOs are kind of going like, we gotta get out there, we gotta, you know, and they've got big ties to open AI, right? How do we get this into our customers' hands, which is what you're seeing Today, this is a year later than this, and, and you know, like virtually AI is everywhere. So, who do you think is primarily responsible or most responsible for ensuring the ethical use of AI? Do you want your developers or system creators, the Microsofts, the Googles? Do you want governments regulating it? Do you want individuals and users? Do you want to have a say over it? Or is it maybe a, a combination of those? And I just threw that in there today the, the combination of creators and governments. I, I think personally, like, we're going to have to have these kinds of conversations, right? I don't think any of us wants the government controlling every aspect of our lives. I don't think we want corporations and stuff. And individuals may not be well positioned to make all of these kinds of decisions. So I think probably there will be some sort of combination of, of these uh, um, three that, that sort of, and again, I'm not an AI expert, but you know, from a business perspective, you know, sort of who are your customers? What are regulations you have to sort of be aware of? Well, who works for you and, and sort of what are their beliefs? But I think this is going to be a, a, a question that you are going to be dealing with as you go, whatever your industry, because much like the internet when I was at school, um, I got my access to the internet in 1992. I was, think it was in my third or fourth year at the university here. You know what? This is your internet. I think it's going to change industry, your lives, as much as the internet did, right? And so the question is like, what's right and wrong? Like we have lots of questions even today. What should we put out there? How do we make use of uh, something like the internet? Uh, March, uh, good news, ChatGPT would probably fail the CFA exam. Well, that's good, right? Sort of raises the question, like, do you want AIs uh, passing those exams? Uh, April, AI will not displace everyone, everywhere, all at once. It will rapidly transform the labor market, exasperating inequality, insecurity, and poverty. This is about sort of the idea of use of uh, uh, universal basic income, right? Like, what do jobs look like? Uh, I don't know if anyone's seen Pixar's Up, right? Will AI take your job, right? Yeah, I'm looking forward to the free time. That's up. Everyone's sort of in, uh, or not up, uh, Wally. -E. They're sort of floating suspensor. They got so much time. They got nothing to do but watch TV and kind of eat and have robots serve them. Uh, no, but I would work along and say, I, I, I agree. Yeah. I know we've been talking a lot about like, will I take over jobs? And I think a lot of the things that you hear over and over from a ton of different industries is this job requires a human connection. Yeah. But at some point, do you see the AI taking over that human connection and maybe we're being naive? Well, I mean, that's. I, <laughs> I still think humans are pretty important. Like I think once, and I'm a fan of the Terminator movies. I grew up on the Terminator movies, but I think at some point, and if you look at someone like Sam Harris, he, he's definitely on the negative side, the downside of, of AI. Much like you might have an anthill in your backyard, this is Sam Harris sort of says like, AI is not gonna maybe be like the Terminator and come wipe us out, but it might be just like accidentally, or it's just we're more of an inconvenience. Uh, I think that's a long way off. I mean, if we don't sort of, again, Caveat, I'm not an expert in this kind of stuff, but but I think we're pretty smart. We've lived through a lot of things. We survived on this planet when maybe we shouldn't have. I mean, if we can sort of not blow ourselves up, I, I think that's a pretty good thing. But I don't know, I, I really think 
even I heard someone, uh, Heather said today in her talk, like, we don't even know what the jobs of the future are. So we will always find new jobs. Like we didn't have the job I said to some students at lunch as an Instagram influencer, like 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, we've got these new jobs because of the tools are there. So I think, yeah, jobs are gonna be replaced and maybe they're jobs we don't wanna do, uh, but I'm not sure we'll ever get to a point, you know, you can come back and, and tell me I'm wrong, but I think we'll sort of cope and, and we'll sort of figure this stuff out. And that's where I think the innovation aspect of this comes in. Like we have to be prepared to do that. We can't just sort of think that Life is going to be exactly like it is. Cause I'm really trying to show like, it's not like it's changed so much even in the last year. And we may not be a realize, uh, be aware of it, but be aware of it. Sort of do that research, start reading, start trying things out and seeing what's out there. Whatever your industry is, be the ones that are sort of bringing in the AI. So uh, I guess I'll be more positive than Sam Harris and say, no, I think, I think we're pretty good as, you know, we're pretty important and, and uh, I think we'll sort of make use of it. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy and and uh, everything will be smooth. No, absolutely not. Like it will be hard, but uh, no, I think I'm pretty positive on on it. I could be completely wrong, but I'm a half glass half full kind of person. So, I, I mean, going back to that previous story, like I was interested in this one just because of uh, you know AI got a lot of jobs doesn't mean everyone will be jobless. Like jobs will look different, but not ever. Like we have a lot of division in you know sort of income equality. I, I think that is something like I think we should look at governments to kind of help with and, and sort of recognize. And maybe we don't do that, and that's going to be challenging. Like I'm not sure Elon Musk has sort of got uh, you know human race's best interest in mind, but um, you know doesn't mean we can't have that. And I really am positive with your generation. Like I think you're going to. Yeah, your job's gonna be cleaning up a lot of the mess. <laughs> it's unfortunate, um, but uh, you know, I, I really have high faith in, in you guys just being able to solve some of these problems here. Uh, May, uh, Ted Chang, he's a science fiction writer, worthwhile reading. He did actually the uh, Interstellar. Was it Interstellar? I'm thinking of maybe another one, uh, but uh, you know, science fiction writer, but he's sort of talking about, will AI become the new McKinsey? He sort of brings this idea of uh, AI as a management consulting company, asking it questions, what should we do? Sometimes if you want something done, but don't want to get your hands dirty, Getting an AI to do it for you, finding those jobs that maybe humans don't want to do. Think of AI as a broad set of technologies being marketed to companies, which is exactly what Microsoft, Google, OpenAI. I'm going to talk about the uh, AI, uh, OpenAI, you know, Sam Altman stepping down, the board trying to fire him, and then coming back two days later on the weekend. Like, what the heck happened there? I don't know. I'm not sure we'll ever know, but uh, I, I think it's, it's sort of uh, how do we make money? <laughs> right? Like, how do we, uh, you know, sort of have this product here and, and uh, how do we? raise the money we need to raise to continue to push this forward to maybe an artificial general intelligence, whatever that means at some point in the future. Uh, June, why transform transformative artificial intelligence is really, really hard to achieve. This may go back to some of the questions we were sort of talking about prior. Like, I, I, we haven't even figured out what to do with the AI that we currently have, let alone like, what does the, the next one uh, look like? Um, what if real world impact requires doing tasks that we're not even aware of, right? Hard problems are easy. Asking AI to tie your shoelaces, that's pretty hard to do for AI right now. We can do it without a problem. Going back to maybe your question, like maybe there's just things we're good at doing that we can't get robots to do right now or AI. Yeah. That's right, exactly. Yeah, it, it's the bias. And how do you remove that, right? That's where I think the social sciences is gonna be really important here. I like that last bullet point there. I pulled it out of there. A human knowledge is tacit, unrecorded and diffuse. Like how can we feed what's in our brain into an AI when everything that makes us valuable is in our head? You know, like you hear about people in investments. I just made that investment at the right time or a coach, you know, I just felt like the right time to pull that goalie and put in a new one or whatever it was, or to call that time out. It's like, how do you get AI? Like, how do you feed that information that makes us human into an artificial intelligence? Yes, I know about Elon Musk's neural link and maybe that's safe, maybe it's not safe. Maybe we will eventually, you know, be able to plug into the uh, metaverse or whatever it is. Um, but I think right now, like, I'm not sure we ever get to a point where we can remove biases. I, again, I, I, I'm not a, AI expert, but uh, I am a human <laughs> and I tend to be like, if we can, we can make it whatever we want, right? But we have to have sort of the understanding and, and the desire to do it. Uh, July, how can we teach children so they survive AI, cope with whatever comes next? I thought this was interesting as someone as a, 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 a teacher, right? Rigidity is lethal, right? Anyone carrying a Blackberry in their pocket? Right? They refused <laughs> to adopt a full screen touch uh, phone uh, until it was too late, right? That's rigidity. Fixed pattern of thought and action will enhance their vulnerability to rapid and massive change, right? So if we don't sort of teach students how to be flexible, how to sort of think outside the box, which I'm sure you hear in all of your classes, I, I talk about it. Uh, I like the idea of the exam systems uh, create artificial borders, no such boundaries in nature, right? 
everything that we sort of talk about, and I'm sure you look at all the keynotes, all of the breakout sessions talk about like, there's no boundaries. <laughs> there's like, ah, oh, we do this and we do this and we do a bit of this and a bit of that. And it's, you know, like, sure, you can be an expert in something. I think that's part of why you're going to school. But don't be sort of uh, pigeonholed, right? Do, be prepared. Failing to see the bigger part, like, picture, right? Uh, our interdisciplinary thinking is weak. If we keep failing to see the bigger picture, it's partly because we have been trained so brutally to compartmentalize math, English, social studies in elementary school. Here's cursive writing. You know, here's gym class. Like, not a lot of cross contamination or pollination, maybe is a better word, right? Interesting. So, let me ask you this question Do you think? K-12 schools should include some sort of basic AI education in their curriculum. I don't think we hear it in Alberta, right? But is that something that we should think about bringing in in the future to better prepare students in elementary, junior high school, high school to be prepared to the new work world, which I think is coming, right? Like there's no way we're gonna turn off AI, right? Google, Microsoft, OpenAI are not all of a sudden gonna decide like, this whole AI thing is kind of a bust. Right? I'm not sure we're willing to turn back. Uh, the same thing was said about the internet as well. Ask him go. It's a fad. Right? Well, it's not a fad. It's here. Uh, is it crappy? Yeah, because business. But you know, we're going to build a new, better inter uh, internet at some point here. Now, ask me what that new curriculum looks like. I have no idea. This is what I say. Lots of questions, but we've never dealt with an building an educational cur curriculum with AI, right? We haven't had the opportunity. So maybe some of you find yourself working for, I don't know, the government in, in uh, the Department of Education or whatever they call it these days, or maybe a school district, or maybe your parents are part of that. And they're starting to think about this kind of stuff. Like this is where the business, the in innovation, I think uh, is really important around AI. Not writing it, but what's out there? And, and what does it mean to us in terms of education? Unions, you deserve a tech union, right? This is a uh, uh, developers, right? You can get AI to write code for you. Go in and, and uh, to Microsoft's Copilot, start writing code, right? This idea of de-skilling. Software alone can't displace you workers, but we do have to protect ourselves. So maybe there is value in some of these unions that we see there. I personally think there is, right? We should protect workers, right? There should be safety. And uh, well, that's policy. That's sort of humans kind of recognizing like it's important to protect this kind of stuff, right? Because if we don't, well, then that's where I think we start to <laughs> run into. Uh, we don't have jobs. So I thought this was kind of interesting just around sort of the unionization of jobs that are being displaced with this kind of uh, technology that's out there. And it is decision makers at organizations that are, are driving those decisions right now, right? Profit above all? I don't know. I'm not an economist, but every time I hear someone talk about the economy, it's good to have people working. Well, if we don't have people working, how is that a good economy? So we're dealing with that in terms of artificial intelligence. Uh, another one, schools, uh, this is uh, August. Weird preparing for the new semester in, in September there. Schools are teaching ChatGPT, so students. So in seven or eight months, we start to see maybe a shift in some places rather than trying to ban it. Now we're trying to teach students. You know, AI tools as part of their everyday work. Transparency, adopting the technology, right? And that's what, six, seven months in terms of, of the timeline that I'm kind of showing you here. And yes, I'm cherry picking articles and I can find articles that support, but this is just things that I caught my eye as I was sort of browse my newsfeed as, as it comes across here. But it starts again to raise those questions. Okay, well now how's that fit into curriculums? How do we use these tools in ways that are beneficial, right? Goes back to the examining. Well, if we've got these kinds of tools, well, how do we write an exam now? Right? What does that look like? These are all sort of questions. And yeah, we're talking about education and, and things here. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows John Carmack wrote uh, Doom. Uh, on the computer, the PC, I don't know, probably in the 80s, I remember playing it. Uh, Quake was another one. Uh, ended up uh, getting a job or, or uh, uh, working at Facebook for their uh, virtual reality, their Meta Quest or whatever they call it now. I think it was the Oculus Rift before that, but now sort of been rebranded. Well, him and Rich Sutton, I don't know if you're aware of him, but he's one of the big researchers at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute on the University of Alberta campus. Their partnership is uh, about artificial general intelligence, right? They have this sort of, uh, uh, document that they've been working on, the Alberta plan. I put a copy of it in the Google Drive. I've got a, a link to it at the end. Um, seeks to understand and create long-lived computation agents that interact with a vastly more complex world and come to predict and control their sensory input signals. I have no idea what that means, but two big names in sort of the tech sphere uh, industry partnering here, an Alberta-Edmonton connection. Interesting, right? Not sure what comes of it, but there's lots of money sort of being uh, changed hands and, and sort of trying to figure out like, how can we use this? Is there an innovation out there? Is there some sort of product that maybe we can 
uh, talk about. Lawrence Lessig, uh, again, Harvard professor, I sort of mentioned him earlier, social media are causing free speech crisis for the internet. He's really interesting to read. I thought at one point when I was going through my own crisis, going like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Uh, I thought I might want to be a copyright lawyer or sort of an intellectual property lawyer. Read a lot of his books, early books, just fascinating sort of about the internet. And, and uh, if you know anything about the history of music, Napster, file sharing, BitTorrent, Apple comes along with iTunes, starts selling uh, songs for uh, a dollar a piece. And, and that really changed the music industry, obviously the movie and television industry, but lots of questions around who owns the content, how do you protect it? I think maybe if you're sort of following Mickey Mouse, uh, the original uh, cartoon that was uh, Mickey was based on is now in the public domain, which was a big deal because Disney fought many <laughs> decades to make sure that didn't happen, and it happened uh, at the beginning of this year, which was kind of an interesting thing. So lots of questions about sort of the idea of copyright uh, that we've been talking about. I'm watching the time here. Here we are, November. Remember I said uh, ChatGPT couldn't write the text? Well, now it's getting better at doing it. And this is, what, maybe a year later. ChatGPT can ace the bar, but it only has a decent chance of passing the CFA, right? And here's a list. And so this is uh, uh, from Business Insider. Um, you know, ChatGPT4, obviously the new version of it. but. You know, here's a question for you. Those of you who think maybe you're going on to CPA, should passing an industry exam, like think CPA, CFA, BIR, the bar exam, be the sole criterion for AI to practice in professions like accounting, finance, and law? If it can pass the test, then why couldn't it be a lawyer? And maybe that's going to happen at some point in the future, right? I like it. That's what I thought, right? Like, sure, but I don't think I would hire a lawyer, but maybe I'd hire a lawyer to, I don't know, sell my used car to someone, and maybe I'd just go on to some AI. Like, it starts to raise lots of questions, right? And I think, you know, it's okay to think about, like, if you're gonna go write your CPA and ChatGPT can do it, or Google Gemini or whatever it is, like, we're still human. <laughs> like, I still think we have, I'm not sure Google or Siri or any of these are, are very good at, at being kind to people, talking to people like, hey, how's the kids? You know, how's the family? That's where I think we start to bring it, but we can start to use these tools, right? If it's if we can start to trust them, right? I think I even bring up a slide here that sort of has that word highlighted. Trust, yeah. I think like what if AI was used to build those exams? Like if it was made to write them. Yeah. In theory, like it would make sense if it can write it, then it should be able to pass it. Yeah, that's right. And I'll tell you, honestly, I use ChatGPT and, and AI to write questions for some exams. I review it myself and make sure I know what I want to do. But then I start thinking, well, if students are using it to answer those questions with AI and I'm using it to generate, like now I use it to work, is it just AI uh, all the way down? What's that name of that John Green book? Hurdles all the way down. Is it AI all the way down? And what do we do as humans? Well, maybe it does end up like something like uh, Wally or something. But I think it, it's an interesting question. And I'm sure, like, using these kinds of tools to write cases and those kinds of things. Um, I'm sure it's done now. <laughs> like, you guys use it, I use it, we all kind of use it. Um, but I think it's going to change. And maybe it changes what that exam means. Like, maybe how do you, like, I, I think I'm really sort of a firm believer, like, the way we assess people in 2024 is maybe not the right way, given the state of the world. Like, maybe that worked in 1984. Oh, my God, 1984. 1983, <laughs> you know, 2003. Like, I think there's different ways to assess like your grade letters are about that performance class. It doesn't have anything to do with the clubs you're part of, the how you interact with people. Like to me, I think that's all valuable as, as uh, you know, maybe a potential hire. So to me, it, it's an interesting question. I think you raise a good question there, right? Like, you know, what does it mean if, if the AI is actually writing this and, and maybe even administering? Think about, has anyone had an interview where we're going to record this and have AI look at it to see the kind of person you are? Like, I don't know, is that is that fair? I don't know. See, lots of questions, no answers. Uh, details emerge of surprise board coup. This is the one that happened in November, so pretty much exactly a year from the release of it, although this is the 18th, so maybe a week earlier. But disagreements had emerged. Altman was pushed, uh, pushing for commercialization and gro company growth. The board was sort of saying, no, we've got to take a more ethical approach to it. Uh, the commercialization won because he's back, and now they're sort of pushing forward with commercialization. So I don't know what that means, but uh, you know, there was sort of this uh, board was kind of saying, you're pushing too far too fast. And I think that's a concern. I think it's a, a, an absolutely valid concern, but it doesn't mean that OpenAI can't go on and, and start to continue to push this uh, technology forward. This one I came across just in December at Christmas time, uh, our Amazon warehouse here in uh, uh, just, I guess, south of Edmonton, and I don't even know where it is, Edmonton, uh, Amazon YEG2. Lots of AI used there just for uh, packaging, you know, dealing with the, the uh, uh, just the influx of, of uh, purchasing and, and ordering and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know, like I know students that have graduated from the University of Alberta in our program here and are managing, you know, 
these warehouses and and the uh, technology that's in it. That's why I'll sort of bring this around to business technology management. That was global new global global news online, which is not a bad website. Uh, thousands of software engineers say the job market is getting much worse. Right? I'm got a computer engineering background. Um, there's no way I'd write code in my world today. I'm not interested in it. Maybe I'm a little bit too old for that. But when you start to see AI, the role of the developer changes. Right? Apple is working on uh, a, a tool to enable just anyone to write an app on an iPad just by dragging and dropping things. Some of you probably have used Scratch uh, to do that. Um, really, where you're not writing a lot of sort of low-level code, but I think that's sort of the future. And so looming threat of artificial intelligence field is starting to become a little less secure. Like if you went into computer engineering, you could make a few hundred thousand dollars a year, two, three hundred thousand dollars a year writing code at Facebook or Google or something like that. You know, has anyone seen the tech layoffs that are going on right now? Like, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if part of that is the job is changing. And I think we're starting to see this. This was just in January here on Vice. Uh, and then Sora, well, this is February, turns uh, AI prompts into photorealistic videos. I sort of watched this, it's beginning. They sort of gave some, and this was uh, uh, Stephen Levy. He's a long time technologist, uh, wired. I, I really appreciate uh, as just an interesting uh, magazine or, or website with interesting stories there. Um, you know, OpenAI's chatbox can pass the bar exam without going to law school. OpenAI app called Sora hopes to master cinema without going to film school. And I don't know if anyone's seen the trailers for the new Dune part two, but I don't know how they create those worlds and, and those kinds of things, but I'm sure there's sort of some AI part of it. Um, you know, this was a bit more controlled, right? OpenAI didn't let me enter my own prompt, so they're obviously marketing this and kind of saying, like, here's some possibilities, but it's not something that we can use, but it's coming. Right? Google started trying to keep uh, pace with that. Uh, and so I think my last question here is, uh, have you ever encountered AI-generated content that you mistook for real information? It goes back to, I think, what you were saying, you know, sort of misinformation, propaganda. You know, can you, you know, sort of create things that, that maybe aren't real? How do you know? Is there watermarks? I know Google was really sort of in their uh, developer conference in, in uh, uh, May. We're sort of saying we're going to put watermarks in a lot of our AI generated content so it's easier to identify. I'm not sure they've done it. I haven't seen a tool to look at it, but maybe that's something that happens here. Right. No one has never seen it, so I think we sort of are all kind of aware that it's out there, that it's something that maybe we do have to be a little bit aware of. Uh, Google's no version of Gemini can handle far bigger amounts of data. Right, Plugging in 402 page manuscripts, transcripts, and being able to pick out certain parts of that. Like, What does that mean for someone doing audit in a firm? Right, Here's, you know, Billion transactions. Okay, uh, Gemini, you know, find the anomalies, the things that don't sort of match, and maybe that's almost instantaneously. I think someone asked the question about quantum computing. Like, does that become something that is absolutely possible in not 17 days, but maybe you can do it in 17 nanoseconds because we've got these hugely powerful, you know, sort of quantum computers. This is all coming. Right? I don't know if it's here. I don't know if it's valuable. I don't. But it's really going to continue to change the world. All right. So in the last. I'll give myself eight minutes if I can. Um, I'm happy to hang around and answer questions. I'm not sure if you have questions. I'm not an expert, but I can definitely talk about it. But I do just want to kind of say the innovation side of things. So that's kind of a tour that I just handpicked, cherry picked some interesting articles that I thought were interesting. Well, what does it mean for organizations? I kind of raised the idea you know, around the school board. Like, how do you start to do this kind of things? Well, that's what I call business technology management. That's my background. Right? I'm not in finance. I'm not in accounting, but I've worked for firms that have accounting and finance, and I've worked hand in hand, and it really is about sort of managing those technologies. So BTM, or business technology management, focus on both the development and use of technology and the uh, tools that help people get things done. So I think we all use sort of computers. I always like to say in class, like, please shut off your computers, turn them into airplane mode, don't go on the internet, and people are like, yeah, give me a break, Rob. Right? It's kind of integrated into our uh, work. Right, really enabling organizations to be build better experiences for their stakeholders, whether they're customers, whether they're uh, you know senior leaderships, whether it's their customers. Uh, I said customers, their employees is what I meant to say. Right, so I think understanding the work that organization does—that's the processes. Like, what do we do? Right, the people that do it and the technology they use to accomplish that. And I think AI is definitely becoming, if it's not already, one of those tools that will be used to, to do this sort of stuff. So, innovation requires uh, BTM. Right, understanding of, of uh, organizational goals and strategies. I think that's you. Right, you're in business school. You are understanding and learning about strategies and goals and and sort of you know what does this organization need to accomplish. Look at all of the keynote that you've heard about. Look at all the other breakout sessions. It's all about like sort of like the business side of things. Right, 
IT alignment for solving business problems. That's where I start to say from a BTM perspective, how do we use technology? Maybe it is an email. Like I've been in plenty of businesses that don't have email systems. And it's like, my God, like what are you doing here? They're doing things by hand. I mean, that still happens out there in, in the real world. Making that business case for adopting technology. Like writing the documents, like where is the value? How do we do this? Prioritizing requirements, data literacy, project management. Uh, Heather and her talk from, I can't remember the acronym, ARC or whatever it was. Um, Lots of project management, managing the dollars, managing the time, the people that are doing it, the investments. I mean, that's hugely important. Well, start managing the implementation of uh, AI, like ChatGPT or Google's Gemini. What does that mean? How much does it cost? How long, you know, how do you maintain it? Testing, implementation, risk management, the business continuity, making sure things that, you know, sort of don't get shut down. And I always like the slide. I always uh, start my introductory uh, business technology class with it. This is what, an IT department looked like when I was working it, right? We we're kind of like this barrier between the technology and the people in the organization, the processes that they did to operate the business. What's happened today is like that IT department may in fact be gone in a lot of organizations. And it really, a lot of that just falls to the people, right? You, that's why there's sort of an expectation that you understand technology. If people look at you, your grandparents are like, my God, you guys are the tech geniuses. And they all come to me and go, oh, we're not tech geniuses. And you are, right? And I think it's a lot because like the, I even in this slide here, like I think the people just bypass IT right now. They're just a pain. <laughs> like they may do things like your payroll system, but other than that, like making sure it's up and running, it really is the business, the people within the organization, I think that are, are sort of doing it. So, you know, you're responsible for this kind of stuff. So understanding AI, the capabilities, the risks, what's it good for, what it's not good for, like that's just business technology management. Like I'm an accountant, I'm a marketing person, I'm a, an HR, I'm aware of these tools. Well, how does that start to fit into an organization? And you start to see the complexities, right? Because organizations are made up of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people. Are there organizations that have millions of people? I think there probably is governments, <laughs> right? The complexity comes, but remember, you're all sort of just individuals. So I think there's two streams of innovation when it comes to AI. One, there's kind of the innovations in artificial intelligence. That's where I think your computer scientists, your developers, your sort of data scientists, your mathematicians, you know, sort of all of the people that we sort of view and go like, oh my God, you guys are so smart. And they are, that's not me. And the other side is just like, how do you take that artificial intelligence and how do you start to innovate with it, right? So if you look at sort of the AI innovations, and I don't think that's any of us here, you know, it really is creating those building blocks for the future. How do we use a Lego set with a million pieces to build something that's really interesting? Well, I think the AI right now is just those blocks. We're not sure how to put them together. And I'm not sure we want the engineers to do that. I'm not sure, and I'm not saying they can't be involved, but you know, they maybe don't have sort of the ethical side of things. I'm not saying engineers aren't ethical, but I'm just sort of saying like the business, the strategies, the, the sort of cost sides of things, right? Things like large language models, which we're kind of right in the middle of here, text to video generation, right? This is from Canva. They've got this sort of capability, you know, give me a video of a skier doing tricks on a ski school. And whether they're pulling that from a copyrighted document or they're doing, uh, generating their own, we don't know, right? Explainable UI or AI. Like what is even happening? This is a big challenge. We don't even know what's happening behind these AIs. So if we can start to build these building blocks, well, now we can start to innovate with those building blocks, right? Applying existing AI techniques, solving problems, right? Improving processes within organizations that maybe we don't want to do. We start applying it, right? Things like medical diagnosis and treatment, right? Predictive maintenance. When is that, you know, truck that's going back and forth to the car sands or the oil sands or whatever it is to the refinery, like when's that going to break down? How often do we have to do it? Think of that in, in terms of like, uh, professional sports, auto racing, all that kind of stuff. You're starting to see a lot of this come into there, right? Automated grading and feedback. I'm starting to think about like, can I use AI to grade students' uh, submissions, particularly the ones that are like, you know, like an English paper, right? I'd have a real problem if an English professor said, don't use it to write the paper, but I'm gonna use it to grade it, but that may be where we are at some point in the future, right? So just some tips, and I take a few more minutes of your time. Get familiar with AI. Yeah, start to play with it if you haven't. I think most of you have, but don't be shy. Try it out. You can't break things. See what's capable of, right? Start to think about problems that you want AI to solve, maybe for yourself, or if you work for an organization, what those problems start to look like. Obviously, from a business perspective, you're not going to sort of get unlimited budgets. Right? You're going to have to start to make business cases. It will involve lots of sort of research and, and conversations and sort of proof, like here's the ROI on this, and here's my work that shows those sorts of things, right? Acknowledge that there is going to be an internal capability gap. Like people just, this is just new. I mean, we've never sort of been at a point in time where we have experts that know how to use these kinds of things. And so you may be 
part of the bridge of that capability gap and just kind of say like, look, it'd be great if, you know, I went, got a training course. I want to go learn this. I want to try this. Maybe I do want to sign up for ChatGPT Pro or whatever. And I just want to start playing with it. Like that's sort of that capability, making sure that you can sort of be addressed those kinds of things. Uh, if not, start to bring in experts, set up pilot projects, start looking at places where we can start to, um, you know, implement these kinds of things. Uh, this is more from a business perspective, form a task force to assess data. Data, 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 you don't do AI without data. If it's garbage data, you're gonna get garbage AI. So you're gonna have to start dealing with the garbage data that is in every organization. Uh, data is not sort of pristine. It's not perfect in any organization. And so how do you deal with that? Maybe that starts to raise the question of bias and all that kind of stuff. Like maybe it's just garbage data. Start small. Don't try to, you know, sort of take on the world. But find small, interesting things. I think that's what's sort of happening right now with a, a number of you guys, the students. So like, you know, maybe it's not writing your whole project, but maybe it's like just doing grammar teching. I mean, that's starting small, starting to think about how we can expand and tell other things. Uh, include data storage, right? This whole idea of big data, internet of things, just sensors out there collecting this massive amount of data. Well, where do we store it? Where does that go? How do we access it with you know low latency and, and get at, you know, How do we trust it? Those are all sort of questions, right? Incorporate AI as part of your daily tasks. And I think you're starting to do that if you sort of start to use AI here. Building with balance, effective AI implementation requires both a clear vision and an awareness of technology limitations. What's possible? That kind of goes back to you know sort of the first point. Try things out. What are the limitations? Uh, so what can you do just to finish up here? You know, do some research. You saw my list of, I don't know, 20 news stories there. I just sort of keep an eye on things. Just if you're happy, uh, I've given some recommendations here. The Verge, Wired, uh, Ars Technica is a good one that I sort of follow. Lots of sort of uh, main uh, meaty type articles. Tech Meme is another one that sort of just grabs headlines so you can sort of all at once. I do, you know, sort of browse Reddit and, and uh, sort of see what's out there. Uh, Medium, just everyone can be an expert, uh, you know, sort of being aware of Substack. I know there's some issues with, uh, uh, you know, some of the hate speech that goes on there, but uh, whatever, there's still some interesting people. You know, start to think about who you trust. Experiment, right? Open chat, uh, open uh, AI chats free right now, four cost dollars, uh, you know, eventually that'll free. I, I, Gemini right now is uh, free if you go to gemini.google.com. Microsoft Copilot is starting to be built into Windows. Apple's working on something. I'm not sure they've, you know, in true Apple fashion, they just don't talk about it until they're ready to release something. And then you go, like, I don't know what this is, but, you know, never count out uh, Apple. Text image, video, try playing with some of these kinds of things. I know a lot of you use Canva and that kind of stuff. If you're interested in programming, Python, R, you know, we've got a class where we sort of start to look at things like Google TensorFlow. There are free available libraries out there for maybe a little bit more on the technical side of things. So I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, I'm happy to hang around. Um, but really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's my connection information. Um, if you're interested, uh, that's my LinkedIn. I, I'm kind of shy online, but uh, I'm happy to connect uh, if you like. Uh, and then on, I'm just going to flip to the next slide, but uh, uh, there's a link. I'll sort of make this available to you. Um, RJS underscore RMBS 2024, a bitly um, in terms of uh, getting the slides if you're interested in it. So I'll leave that up there. I'm happy to hang out uh, if you like. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you at dinner and have a good night. Oh my gosh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Also, we have these like little enrollment forms. I'm sure John can talk about them, but they're giving out free glasses of champagne to you guys for news at the next mm. uh, first come, first serve. So if anyone wants one, perfect. Free champagne. I mean, who doesn't want that? Thank you. Free champagne. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll talk. Yeah, you're welcome.